okay <clears throat> good morning guys so today i am going to talk two important topics in gynecology both belong to the uh, you know disorders of uterus one is benign tumor that is called fibroid uterus also known as leomyoma uteri or in a pathological term you know it is a you know leomyoma smooth muscle tumor benign tumor of smooth muscle and on the other hand after i finish this topic this is not very long i deal with malignant tumor which arises from the uterus that is endometrial carcinoma and these are very very important topic from the exam point of view now before we enter into the topic proper what are the common differential diagnosis of enlarged uterus that type of question may be asked to you by your examiner okay very important uh, uh, causes are only mentioned here but there are some more there definitely number one is pregnancy pregnancy most common cause of enlarged uterus in the reproductive year apart from that some pathological causes are there like leomyoma adenomyosis when those endometrial glands they grow inside the myometrium of the uterus we call them adenomyosis overall size of the uterus becomes bigger that is the meaning even endometrial carcinoma can cause uterine enlargement endometrial hyperplasia can cause slight enlargement of the uterus okay so there are some other causes now let's enter into the topic proper this is leomyoma of the uterus this is also known as fibroid okay just the myoma or fibromyoma now these all are synonymous term so in if you refer to different textbook they may have mentioned these name differently but the meaning is same fibromyoma is a structure it is made up of fibrous tissue as well as smooth muscle it's a benign smooth muscle growth of the myometrium okay this is a benign tumor which develops from smooth muscle this is the most common benign tumor of the uterus and this is a this is common thing during reproductive age group now reproductive age group means 15 to 45 years okay it can develop in a number of anatomical location sometimes it may develop in the body of the uterus sometimes in the fundus of the uterus and sometimes even the cervix it occur in two or three out of every 10 women over the age of 35 so till till the age of uh, 45 you know they, it is counted as a reproductive age group but that is just the average one sometimes a lady may continue to menstruate till 50 or even 53 or 54 years of age you know it has it has been seen so in her the reproductive age group is quite longer so see there in 2 to 3 out of every 10 women over the age of 35 okay below the age of 35 also it can happen it is common to have more than one fibroid sometimes there are multiple and see that some case reports they have you know reported as as many as 100 fibroids have been reported but usually there is one or sometimes there is more than one and those are different types of fibroid some fibroid are you know inside the muscle right at the center of the muscle and they grow either inwards or outwards okay some fibroids are predominantly lie outwards I mean just below the serosal surface and some fibroid they lie just below the mucosa so accordingly we have got different terms or different type i'll talk about that later okay i'll talk about them later now fibroids occur most often in women between between the ages of 30 and 50 3 out of every 10 hysterectomy in the united states are performed because of fibroid not only in usa <clears throat> because we often follow the you know western textbook that's why it is mentioned like that but it may be true everywhere <clears throat> three out of every 10 hysterectomy in the us are performed because of fibroid and it may be true in other places as well so what is the you know thing we have learned here this is a very common condition uh, and the treatment one of the treatment is hysterectomy here 
especially if that lady has completed the family hysterectomy can be done and it is one of the commonest indication for hysterectomy now let's move on what are the types of fibroid just now i talked a little bit about that it depends on the location where exactly where okay uterus has got uh, you know three layers every one of you know what are those three layers can you tell me once again what are three layers of uterus perimetrium myometrium endometrium endometrium excellent okay very easy question perimetrium this is perimetrium here this is myometrium the thick muscle layer myometrium the innermost layer is endometrium endometrium so now accordingly you know where is the tumor located we have given the name so this is intramural intramural mural means wall okay so it is present right in the wall wall is made up of muscle so it is mainly present inside the muscle the most common location of leiomyoma is within the wall of the uterus now when it's small it is usually asymptomatic and cannot be felt on examination unless it is it is so big that you know it somehow changes the shape of the uterus the contour means shape of the uterus definitely if there is a big fibroid you know <clears throat> it will change the shape of the uterus when we are examining or palpating the uterus it feels something different this is because of the big mass now it grows inside the wall of the uterus and sometimes what it does uh, for example if it is present right there okay in this area see this is the fundus of the uterus and from this area the fallopian tubes will you know start so it may even block the opening of fallopian tubes that is one of the uh, important problem here and some sometimes you know if they are present in this area for example cervix this is you know cervical type of fibromyoma so they may even obstruct ureter which is right here okay sometimes and sometimes even the uh, uterine artery the second type is subserosal subserosal now well, serosa is the outermost layer okay serosa is peritoneum actually so subserosal right below the uh, uh, serosa or peritoneum but towards the muscle so it grow outwards from the wall of the uterus into the abdominal cavity that is subserosal it is located beneath the uterine mucus serosa okay that's why subserosal and as they grow they disturb the external contour of the uterus causing form non tender asymmetry which can be detected during examination this is always non tender depending on the location they can put pressure on the urinary bladder urinary bladder rectum or ureter okay so the nearby structures can be compressed by this solid mass these are the benign tumor so they may cause different problem now one of the important point which is asked in your exam is parasitic fibroid now see that they can be pedunculated means they have a stalk and sometimes what happens that stalk is detached okay from the uterus then these fibroid they attach to some other intra abdominal organ and they establish blood supply from that organ and continue to grow this is known as parasitic fibroid so let me repeat again in the beginning they have peduncle or stalk they attach to the uterus by that stalk okay over a period of time what happens they detach themselves from that stalk and attach to the another abdominal organ the example are written here omentum or the mesentery and then they continue to receive blood supply from that particular organ where they attach again and grow this is known as parasitic fibroid now see there so this is a, a picture of uh, subserosal myoma see serosa right below it subserosal and it is usually growing outwards the third type 
okay the third type is sub mucus or sub mucosal you can say now it is right below the you know endometrium it grow inward from the uterine wall taking up space within the cavity of the uterus now what what it does it will make that lumen of the uterus narrow okay it is occupying the space there the endometrial cavity i'm talking about so the lumen becoming narrow so sometimes it may even cause the problem during pregnancy pregnancy you know recurrent abortion can be the problem because there is no space inside the endometrial cavity for the growth of the baby that is one point and another one sometimes even you know conceiving is itself a, dif a difficult thing this can even lead to infertility just think about it okay uh, overall uh, leo myoma i'm talking about if the leo myoma is blocking the opening of fallopian tube now this is a big problem and even continuation of pregnancy can be a problem here the distorted overlying endometrium may not respond appropriately to the normal hormonal fluctuation resulting in unpredictable and intermenstrual bleeding now one of the most common presentation of fibroid is menorrhagia menorrhagia okay heavy menstrual bleeding now what is the average duration for menstrual bleed what is the average period or duration in every cycle sir 5 to 7 days sir 3 to 5 yeah i agree with you you know because the five days exactly. different textbook mention it differently three to five days okay or a three to seven days you can say but average is around four days they say four days usually many many ladies you know they bleed around four days and from the fifth day it stops but your answer is fine now what will happen please mute yourself now see there that is the most common presentation heavy bleeding but sometimes what happens in the middle of the cycle also she starts to bleed okay or in the late cycle she starts to bleed because the endometrium which is growing okay on the top of that myoma doesn't respond to the hormonal fluctuation see that there are different types of bleeding just try to remember the term here uh, they are menorrhagia which is heavy menses metrorrhagia irregular bleeding in between the menses that's what we are talking about you know in the middle of the cycle or a little, little little bit early period than the another menses metrorrhagia and meno metrorrhagia means both uh, though you have uh, learned three uh, you know terms here menorrhagia is the most common presentation of fibroid uterus menorrhagia now let me say a little bit about it how the lady presents to the hospital she will say she is passing a lot of clots a lot of clot clot means it's heavy bleeding clot is never normal in the you know normal menses or normal period whenever she passes clot that means it's a heavy bleeding okay this is one another one more days than the normal for example if average day is 4 she may pass uh, you know uh, blood uh, till 6 day or 7 day that is also considered as a part of menorrhagia now this is see this this is sub mucosal fibroid sub mucosal right below the mucosa or endometrium the pedunculated fibroid means they attach there with a stock this is a pathological term every student know it already peduncle means stock if a fibroid is attached there with a stock it is called pedunculated fibroid now what what can happen blood supply to this fibroid is reaching there through this peduncle or the stock okay so if this uh, you know fibroid get detached from this stock sometimes it may die or it may degenerate it may degenerate that is one possibility now another one especially in the outer parts 
not in inside the uterine cavity, but sometimes some some sometimes here, for example, okay, sub serosal uh, type of uh, pedunculated fibroid. It may detach completely and then attach again to some other uh, intraabdominal organ, and then it may grow there again. That is known as parasitic fibroid. Just now we talked about. Now listen carefully. Sometimes what happens? This is a tumor. Every tumor can grow uncontrollably. Okay. It is uncontrollable type of growth. So it may grow very rapidly, but the blood supply, which is reaching there, may not be enough now. This is a, you know, uh, always, you know, we compare what about the mass and what about the blood supply. So what will happen to this tumor now if blood supply is not enough? Yes. What can happen? Atrophy. Ischemia. Atrophy. Ischemia. 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 Very good. Okay, so you already know the proper term. In the, it is known as ischemia, and later on it may atrophy. If the ischemia is you know prolonged or chronic, it may atrophy or become small in size. And sometimes it may get you know necrosis. There is a death of the you know tissues there, and sometimes it may bleed also. Okay, sometimes it may degenerate. So because of this point, there are so many complications of fibroid, which we'll discuss later on. Now, this is a you know, beautiful picture, which is uh, telling us a lot of things. So I want all students to focus at least. This is the schematic diagram of the internal genital tract of the female. So here are fallopian tubes. You can see her, fallopian tubes. This is ovary, okay? There is another ovary. This is fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. There is ampulla, okay? This is ampulla, this is isthmus, and this is the intramural part. So these are the different fibroid which can, which, which can exist. This is, you know, a pedunculated fibroid. It may get detached and develop into the parasitic fibroid very rarely. Uh, this is sub right below the serosa. It can, uh, you know, grow to become a very big mass. And this is an asymmetrical type of enlargement of the uterus. Now see this? This is known as submucosal. It is growing inside the uterine cavity. Okay, another submucosal again growing towards the lumen. This is intramural fibroid right at the center. So these are the different types. Now let's talk about the natural history of the uterine fibroid. What will happen to them? Changes in size are dependent on the reproductive life stage of the woman. Now, one point, every one of you know already, okay? This is not a new fact. These leomyoma are hormonal dependent tumor. They, uh, you know, rely or depend on estrogen for their growth. If estrogen supply is good enough, they can grow consistently. If we cut the estrogen supply, okay, this tumor will get atrophied. They become small. Never forget this. That's why they are common in reproductive age group where there is estrogen presence. And this is very common in pregnancy because of the increased level of estrogen. Whereas after menopause, even if we do not treat them, you know, this tumor will shrink in size because there is no more estrogen after that. A little bit of estrogen is present because of the conversion uh, from androgen. That is a different thing. But the major amount of estrogen is not present there. So this is a very, very important fact. Now, uh, slow growth okay, and the rapid growth. There are two types of growth in case of uterine and leomyoma. Slow growth means most leomyomas are small. They grow slowly and asymptomatic. And they only... Uh, you know, become massive in size when they cause pelvic pressure symptom. Means when they become big, then they uh, lead to compression of the pelvic organ, then they can cause the problem like urinary bladder. That is a perfect example. Now you all know, if a bladder neck is compressed okay, by the tumor, what will happen to that lady? Yes? Urinary retention will be there, sir. And urinary to the hydronephrosis. Good, good. First of all, urinary retention. Difficult to pass urine. 
Now, after that, the pressure in the urinary bladder will increase. If that is not treated in time, then the pressure will be reflected back towards the both ureter. They may start to dilate or distend. This is known as hydronephrosis. But if we, you know, treat this condition in time, okay, hydronephrosis doesn't occur. It needs a, a bit of, you know, chronic type of problem. Now, what about the rapid growth? The estrogen receptors are increased in leomyoma, resulting in rapid enlargement during times of high estrogen level, like in pregnancy. Definitely, it depends how much estrogen is there. If the lady is taking oral contraceptive pill, then also it can grow fast. If the lady is pregnant, then also it can grow fast. It all depends on the estrogen receptor and the estrogen level. Now, sometimes the leomyoma can degenerate. Degenerate means death, death of the cells. Okay, this is the important pathological term, degeneration. Now, see here. During times of rapid growth, myoma may outgrow their blood supply, resulting in ischemic degeneration of a fibroid. Just now, I explained this pathogenesis to you. This can happen to any tumor which is growing very fast because the blood supply may not be enough okay, uh, for the tumor growth. As a result of that, there will be ischemia, resulting in ischemic degeneration. Now, there are three common type of degeneration in the clinical practice. They are hyaline, calcific, and red degeneration. Hyaline means pink. Okay, Always in pathology or in clinical medicine, whenever you come the come across the term hyaline, that is pink in appearance. Pink means it has a lot of protein. Protein is stained pink. So proteinaceous a material or substance is present there predominantly, hyaline. Calcific is calcium. So there is deposition of calcium in the depth and devitalized tissue. So what type of calcification is this? There are two sir, types of dystrophic, dystrophic calcification. calcification, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. This is the you know thing which you have studied long time ago in pathology. Dystrophic calcification. Another is called metastatic calcification. Now, metastatic calcification occur when there is more calcium level in the blood, and it can just deposit in different organ or tissues, you know. That is a different thing. If calcium is a normal level, but still get deposited in the death and dying or devitalized tissue, we call that dystrophic calcification. This is one of the examples here. And red, red degeneration means there is bleeding now. There is hemorrhage. At the same time, there is infarction as well. That's why it is known as hemorrhagic infarction. Okay, hemorrhagic infarction, see there. Red degeneration is also known as carneous degeneration. This is another term. It can cause extreme and acute pain in that area. And this pain is so much that patient requires hospitalization and the use of narcotics to control the pain. So this is red degeneration. So what is happening? There is acute bleeding going on in that area. That is a closed space, remember? Fibroid is an encapsulated tumor. It has got a capsule there. So when that mass rapidly increases in size because of the bleeding inside, then that causes a lot of pain. Okay, This is known as red degeneration. And this is very frequent during pregnancy because tumor rapidly grow during pregnancy and all the problems start. Now, another type or part of the natural history is shrinkage. Shrinkage means atrophy. When the estrogen level fall, okay, then the tumor will shrink in size. So this is very easy to understand. So definitely it will occur after menopause now. Menopause, okay, cessation of menstruation, permanent cessation. So after that, the amount of estrogen is very, very less. That's why there is the atrophy of the tumor. But sometimes what happens, we utilize this principle 
for the treatment also. Now, please pay attention. This is very easy concept for you. Now, what I tell just now, if we cut the level of estrogen in the body, okay, the tumor will shrink in size. And we can do that by using certain drugs. Okay, this is medically reduced level of estrogen. And that is done by the use of gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH agonist. Okay, GNRH agonist. Now, you may be confused a little bit. What is the function of GNRH actually? They cause increased release of FSH and LH. That is the function of GNRH. And FSH and LH, they act on the gonad. In this case, we are talking about female. So let's talk about ovary. They act on the ovary. And LH especially, it leads to release of estrogen. Then, how come this GNRH agonist will cause decrease level of estrogen. Anybody can tell me what is the mechanism? Sir, when we uh, do, uh, do not give the uh, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone and we give antagonist sir, it does not stimulate the anterior pituitary gland and uh, there is no release of the FSH and LH, uh, there is no production of the uh, uh, estrogen from the gonads, uh, from the ovary in the females. Okay. Sir, uh, sir basically, yes. sir, there is suppression of the ovulation. And sir, this, uh, sir, this suppression of the ovulation, sir, causes the, pro, uh, the decreased production of estrogen and as well as the progesterone hormone specific. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, now, this is, you know, a little bit tricky here. Okay. Now, see that. Let me repeat again. Now, uh, please pay attention, all of the students. Agonist. What do you mean by agonist drug? And what is antagonist? First, tell me that. What is agonist? Sir, agonist is stimulation and sir, antagonist is suppressed, basically. Exactly. They act on the same receptor, okay? Usually same receptor, agonist. They act on the same receptor and they stimulate the receptor for more functioning. That is agonist. Antagonist means they are blocking the receptor. So here, please pay attention. These are agonist drugs. They are not antagonist. See this? They are gonadotropin, releasing hormone, agonist. So logically, they should Negative. exactly Negative. Uh, yeah. Logically, they should uh, stimulate, isn't it? They should uh, stimulate the release of more FSH and LS. Now, what happens here is if we continue to give these medicine, you know, they are actually normally they are having pulsatile release. There is pulses of release of GNRS from the hypothalamus. Pulse means on and off type of release. Okay, that is a normal uh, secretion process for them. But what we do here, we give certain agonist drug which exactly act like GNRH, okay? And if we continue to give this medicine after some time, you know what happens? They okay, do not cause the release of FSS and LH. They do not cause the release. Rather, they cause the suppression of these uh, medicine because we are continuously giving this drug. Okay, we are continuously giving the drug. Now, in in case of pharmacology, you have studied this principle. If we give some type of agonist continuously, okay, they decrease the amount of receptor there. This is called down regulation of receptor. Whereas, if I give antagonist for a certain period of time, it will upregulate the number of receptor there. So it is all about down regulation of the receptor. Okay. Which receptor? GNRH receptor, which stimulate the release of LH and FSH. So what is the lesson? Okay. Let's uh, directly come to the conclusion here. If I continuously to give GNRH agonist, then the level of FSH and LH will go down. Then the level of estrogen secretion will severely decreases. As a result of that, the size of the leomyoma will shrink. We'll talk about that uh, during the you know management part as well. Now see this. Uh, look at this uh, you know uh, picture here. This is a pathological specimen which is showing a huge mass there. I do not know what is this mass because they have not labeled it. Okay, but uh, you know this is a leomyoma. This uterus has been, you know, suffering from 
the big growth leomyoma. Look at the blood vessels on the surface. Look at this shiny membrane. This is probably the peritoneum which is attached on the surface. And another important thing, look at the distortion of the shape of the uterus. Okay, it is severely distorted. This is the disturbance in contour of the uterus. Now, see this, it has been removed, the mass, okay, completely removed. So this is a tumor. Now, this is another, you know, uh, hysterectomy uh, specimen, which is showing the different uh, types of leomyoma. Look at these masses here. See here. This is also mass. Here is another one. Here is another one. And these, okay, are also the masses there. This is the fundus of the uterus, but these are the mass. I can see the rounded mass here. See this, okay? So multiple uh, fibroid are present uh, in the uterus. This is a schematic diagram, which is telling us a lot of things. Uh, here is uterine cavity or the uterus. See this? Now look at the fibroid, which can develop in this uterus. This is a big fibroid here another fibroid here and third fibroid is present here now what are they doing look at the pressure symptom they are providing They're completely compressing the urinary bladder there it is compressing the colon there okay and another uh, or other types of intra-abdominal organs are also compressed so whenever you you tell about the clinical features of the fibroid uterus you can always include this pressure symptom apart from menorrhagia Mer or metrorrhagia. Now, see there. So let's talk about the clinical feature now. Let's include all the understanding which we have till now. The, the, you know, it's easy. In addition to heavy vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain, this is menorrhagia, okay? Menorrhagia or metrorrhagia or a combination of them. Both are included here. As the fibroid uterus enlarges, it creates mass effect upon the adjacent structure and causing a variety of bulk type symptom. Okay, like if the fibroids extending from the front of the uterus can compress the bladder and can cause urinary frequency. If it is just, you know, pressing there, it will lead to increased frequency of the uterus. Sometimes what happens if the pressure is too much, then it can completely lead to incontinence. Okay or rather than incontinence, the retention of the urine, retention of the urine. Incontinence and, you know, urinary frequency is seen in not that severe type of compression. Whereas if the bladder neck or bladder outlet is completely obstructed or blocked, we call it retention of the urine. Now, what is the treatment of urinary retention? Anyone? What is the treatment? Catheterization. Catheterization. Exactly. That's what I want to listen here. Catheterization. Any cause, okay, even a male or female, whoever comes to our hospital and complain, doctor, I cannot pass urine okay, from this many hours. I cannot pass and I'm having severe pain there. One examination you should always do is palpate the urinary bladder. Okay. Don't, don't hurry up for the catheterization. Make sure that urinary bladder is, is increased or enlarged in size. After that, just pass a catheter and the patient will be so thankful to you, you know, because the, the pain is so much in case of retention of the urine. And after that urine is drained, the patient is relieved of that pain. One of the cause of urinary retention, you know, in case of female is a fibroid uterus. Another cause may be pregnancy itself. If the uterus is retrovolted, we have studied that in obstetrics, retrovolted uterus can also lead to acute retention of the urine. Another cause may be bladder stone. If bladder stone is lodging right there in the neck, you know, it can uh, cause urinary retention. In case of older male, what is the common cause of urinary retention? Anybody? BPH. Sir, benign prostate BPH. Very good. Benign prostate Excellent. Benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPS. See that? So this is the way. Your teacher always asks, asks question in this way. Though we are talking gynecology now, 
but let's not forget okay we are studying mbbs and this is the way to remember okay and this is the way we rule out the cases one after other now let's move on fibroids extending from the back of the uterus can compress the colon and cause constipation or bloating you have seen that picture just now uh, for example sigmoid colon if it is compressed then constipation is the problem it is difficult to pass the stool or even the collection of the gas may occur there which can lead to bloating of the abdomen now some other problem if it compresses the nerves then what will happen see this nerves that exit the lower spinal canal can be compressed which can lead to low back pain and leg pain this is known as sciatica okay the sciatica means it is a compression of the roots of sciatic nerve or the trunk of the sciatic nerve itself now what does happen if sciatic nerve is compressed you know sciatic nerve is the thickest nerve of our body remember that it has got two component common peroneal and the tibial in the beginning it is not divided like that but still you know if i look very carefully in that thick nerve though these two components are attached with each other i can still differentiate them yes this is a tibial component and this is a common peroneal component but they have not still divided they divide way down when there is the popliteal fossa if this sciatic nerve is compressed by any masses like prolapsed intervertebral disc pivd we say any tumor like this okay any trauma something like that then there is a shooting type of pain which develops on our back and it is radiating towards the lower limb this is known as sciatica now another problem may be when the uterus enlarges is enough it can push outward on the abdominal wall causing abdominal distortion and in some cases give the appearance of being pregnant it just looks bigger in size and in the reproductive age group if the abdomen is bigger we can think of pregnancy okay but we need to confirm it and another one it can also cause pain during sexual intercourse this is known as dyspareunia so these are all the features of pressure symptom or compression symptoms caused by fibroid okay so let's talk about the diagnosis of fibroid now after doing the clinical features okay uh, the history taking or uh, the symptoms and sign it is very easy for us to make a diagnosis we add investigation here then the diagnosis will be completed so uh, let me start with uh, you know presentation a lady in the reproductive age group probably at the age of 35 or 30 comes to the hospital with excessive vaginal bleeding during period that is known as menorrhagia okay menorrhagia and during examination it has been found that the uterus is distorted during per vaginal examination the uterus is distorted means the shape of the uterus is not maintained this is a very typical you know examination finding now see here in most cases the diagnosis is made clinically by identifying an enlarged asymmetric non tender uterus in the absence of pregnancy so we have to go for pregnancy test in the urine uh, to to make sure the lady is not pregnant or we can take the help of ultrasound as well of further you know confirmation of pregnancy the size of the fibroid how big it is we have to compare with the size of the pregnant uterus and that you have already done uh, in obstetrics remember that so if uh, the pregnant uterus is okay 20 weeks in gestation it will reach the umbilical level and if the pregnant uterus reaches the symphysis pubis level it is approximately 12 weeks in gestation now please don't get confused you know i'm not saying you know uh, this uh, fibroid uterus is same condition as pregnancy that is not the point here the point is how big is the tumor how big is the uterus because of tumor we always compare the size with the pregnancy so we roughly say the uterus is uh, 12 weeks in size 
that means the enlargement of the uterus done by the fibroid is that big in size okay you understand like that let's move on other you know investigation we like to do are ultrasound okay this is known as sonography or ultrasonography it can image a large intramural or subserosal myoma it can confirm how what is the size and where are they another part of ultrasonography or sonography is called saline infusion sonography now saline infusion sonography saline is a normal saline which is infused in the uterine cavity that is around 5 to 10 ml and then you know take on the ultrasound and this ultrasound is done by endovaginal sonogram probe okay the probe of the ultrasound is inserted into the vagina and then the ultrasound is done after instilling or infusing 5 to 10 ml of saline into the uterine cavity it can clearly show the submucosal type of fibroid very easily submucosal one because it is present inside the uterine cavity. Another way is hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy. Now, hysteroscopy is a type of endoscopy which we do into the uterine cavity. So, again, the submucous uh, mucous myoma can be detected quite easily. And histology is always there. With the help of hysteroscopy, we can take the histopathology. I send to the pathology lab and they will give us the diagnosis. Yes, it is a leomyoma or a fibromyoma. Then the diagnosis is confirmed. Now, all of you, please focus on this, uh, you know, ultrasound sonographic picture. This is known as saline ultrasonography. Okay, saline ultrasonography, which is demonstrating an intracavitary leomyoma. This is leomyoma. This is leomyoma. And this is the saline which is infused. So there is a slight density difference you can see there. Okay. So this is how the diagnosis is done with the help of saline ultrasound. Now, after the diagnosis, let's talk about the management. How we manage a case of leomyoma. Now, one important point you have to understand here is if the tumor size are quite small. If they do not, uh, you know, cause a lot of clinical problem, then we can observe them. You do not uh, really need to remove them. So observation is a part of management here. So most leomyoma can be managed conservatively and followed expectantly with regular pelvic examination. But constant follow-up is necessary. We, we ask that lady to come to the hospital probably every few months, you know, just to make sure how big is the uh, fibroid uterus. So during that time, maybe we repeat the ultrasound and uh, measure the size. Another way of managing is pre-surgical shrinkage. Now, you have planned for surgery, but before the surgery, you want to make sure the tumor has become smaller and that is done by certain drugs and this is known as pre-surgical shrinkage. Now just before the break we talk about GNRH analog therapy okay or GNRH agonist therapy. Now see here after three to six months of GNRH analog therapy what happened now it will result in hypo estrogenic state or the level of estrogen is very less in the body. So because of this, there is 60 to 70 percent reduction in size of the fibroid. Now, uh, during surgery, it can be easily removed because the vascularity of the fibroid is less. There is less chance of bleeding. There is less chance of complication during surgery. This is the whole idea. GnRH, okay, gonadotropin, releasing hormone analog therapy. Uh, lupriolide is one of the you know, common drug which is used here, okay? Lupriolide, this is a trade name Lupron is, is used, okay? Now, 
one uh, common question which must come in your mind is what happens if we stop this luprolide is there permanent you know decrease in estrogen level or not now see here once the luprolide is terminated there will be regrowth of the fibroid within 6 month because the cycle will start once again the gnrs will release in a pulsatile fashion it will lead to secretion of lh and fsh and then everything will come back into the order so we need to constantly use this drug if we want to decrease the size gnrs analog cannot be used for a definite cure but they can be used in the adjuvant setting with surgical therapy definitely that's why it is known as pre surgical shrinkage if a myomectomy is done a decrease in size will be associated with decrease in blood loss and if a hysterectomy is planned then perhaps a vaginal instead of abdominal hysterectomy can be performed now let me make it easy for you there are two types of surgery here myomectomy and hysterectomy myomectomy means only the myoma or the fibroid is removed we do not do anything for the uterus or uterus is not removed whereas hysterectomy means along with the tumor the whole uterus is sacrificed in both cases if we can decrease the size of that fibroid then the complication during surgery will be very less that is decrease in blood loss okay uh, that is definite advantage and there are two types of hysterectomy we we can do abdominal and vaginal abdominal means you give abdominal incision okay you open the abdominal cavity and remove the uterus from there whereas vaginal hysterectomy means you do uh, remove the uterus from the vaginal root okay so if the uterus uh, sorry if the myoma size are shrink or atrophied then we can even uh, you know remove the uterus through the vaginal root there is no more obstruction now now another way is myomectomy just now i talked about it myomectomy it's a surgical way see here a surgical procedure performed the patient desires to maintain the fertility means uterus is not sacrificed uterus is still there and the lady say doctor i i want uh, i want to conceive the babies still my, i want to uh, continue my you know uh, family then you cannot remove the uterus then myomectomy is chosen in this case the uterus is incised and the myoma is removed through either a laparoscopic way or a laparotomy way laparotomy is a conventional way we mean the abdominal cavity is you know opened by the big incision whereas laparoscopy is a newer or advanced way here the surgery is done with the help of laparoscope even some other gi surgery can be done through this if the myomectomy incision enter the endometrial cavity delivery of a subsequent pregnancy okay should be done by cesarean section because of increased risk of scar rupture in labor now let me take you back to the discussion of obstetrics here during the topic of cesarean section you must have uh, you know uh, talked about this particular point rupture of scar can occur especially you know uh, if there is a classical type of cesarean section done before the same type of concept here you have removed myomectomy okay and the incision was so much that it has it has reached you know uh, till the endometrial cavity or uterine cavity it almost looks like the classical uh, you know incision now and it has a high chance of rupture so we always deliver this uh, baby Uh, i mean the uh, the next time when she become pregnant by cesarean section this is quite safe so proper history has to be taken how i know that we ask the history was any surgery done uh, prior uh, to this then the lady should answer if she doesn't remember what type of surgery you can check the hospital note another way is embolization okay embolization now see there let me remind you that that principle once again what is that principle if i occlude the blood flow to the myoma or the fibroid it will shrink in size 
it will shrink in size. That is the meaning. So what we do here, we embolize the blood vessel, which are taking blood to the fibroid. So it is similar type of principle, which we have discussed before. This is an invasive radiological procedure in which a catheter is placed uh, into the vessel supplying the myoma and then micro spheres are injected causing ischemia and necrosis of the myoma. So there are certain you know, materials which are injected there. They will lead to the blockage of the blood vessel and lead to ischemia and necrosis of the myoma. This is one of the therapy. Now, the last resort is hysterectomy. Okay, hysterectomy. So what is the indication? If the patient has completed her childbearing, now she already had two to three child, now even one child, it's her choice. If I say, I don't want to be pregnant again, you can go for this option. Okay, this is the meaning. The definitive therapy is total abdominal hysterectomy or total vaginal hysterectomy. Okay, TAS, total abdominal hysterectomy or total vaginal hysterectomy. Let's move on. Now let's uh, you know summarizes the management. Whatever we have studied, uh, everything is mentioned here in a table form. So let me highlight this once again. One of the management is observation. Okay, observation, especially in the early cases when there are not much pressure symptom, when there are not much clinical features, then we can observe. But constant follow up is very, very important one. That is called serial pelvic examination. Pre-surgical shrinkage can be done by GNRH analog or GNRH agonist like luprolite. Okay, uh, we can give it for three to six months, which will significantly decrease the size almost by 70%. And after that, surgery is very easy. Okay, one, one point to remember, after we stop the drug, the tumor will regrow again if it is not removed. That's why uh, this is used only before the surgery. Myomectomy means removal of the tumor itself or tumor only, okay? It preserves the fertility because we have not removed the uterus and it can be done with the help of laparotomy or laparoscopy. Another way is embolization. We shrink the size of a tumor by blocking the blood flow. It will also preserve the uterus. And the final one is hysterectomy. Okay, this is the uh, big surgery. You all know that. Okay, uh, it can be done only after the fertility is completed or the family is completed. And we can go for total abdominal hysterectomy or total vaginal hysterectomy. Remember one point if you go for total abdominal hysterectomy, okay, then uh, it would be nice if we shrink the tumor because the chance of bleeding and chance of complication during surgery is very less. Whereas before doing total vaginal hysterectomy, it is the most because if the size is big, that uterus cannot come out through the vaginal route. Now, with this, let's enter into the one related type of topic. Okay, we always talk these two topics together, that is adenomyosis. Okay. Very short topic. So what is this? See here. Adeno. Adeno means gland. Meiosis is the smooth muscle which is present on the wall of the uterus. Now, you already know what is the meaning. This is an ectopic endometrial glands and stroma which are found within the myometrium of the uterus resulting in a symmetrically enlarged and globular uterus. The uterus will become enlarged in size because the endometrial glands and stroma, stroma means connective tissue substance, okay, are present in the myometrium. This is known as adenomyosis. Now, regarding the incidence, it occurs in almost 30% of the women, of course, in a, in a reproductive age group. See this, okay, 30 to 50. And it is rare in a nulli paras woman who, who never become pregnant before. It is a bit of rare type of phenomena. It often coexists with uterine fibroid and to a lesser extent with endometriosis. That's why we have studied this together. So often coexists with uterine fibroid and to a lesser extent with endometriosis. 
Now, what is endometriosis? Sir, basically, sir, endometriosis, um, uh, sir, when the tissue of the uh, endometrium, sir, grow outside of the endometrium, sir, like uh, it is a sort of um, the ectopic growth of the endometrial tissue, sir. Exactly, exactly, exactly. We'll talk about this. This is a special topic in gynecology, okay? But I have been, uh, you know, telling about this whenever the particular term comes. Uh, endometriosis is the ectopic presence of endometrial tissue in other parts than the normal part. The normal part means uterine cavity or endometrial cavity. This is normal, but it should be present, okay, away from this normal area, like in fallopian tube, like in ovary sometimes, or even in other structure, okay? Sometimes even in the lungs. Cases have been reported. There is, you know, uh, hemoptysis every month uh, because of endometriosis as well. These are very, very rare cases, but they uh, can present like that, okay? So endometriosis and adenomyosis may occur together. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of adenomyosis? See this. Pelvic pain, usually non-cyclical type of pelvic pain. Non-cyclical means during the period of cycle or mens, okay? That is cyclical. And in other time, if the pain occurs, that is non-cyclical. There is a symmetrical uterine enlargement. This is an important point which differentiate it from fibroid. Fibroid uterus has asymmetrical uterine enlargement, whereas adenomyosis has symmetrical uterine enlargement. Another point is dysmenorrhea. Okay? Dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea means painful bleeding or painful menstruation. Now, many ladies have this type of problem. And in adenomyosis, this is one of the important features. Dysmenorrhea in adenomyosis doesn't occur as cyclically as it does in endometriosis. Now, let me clarify once again. In endometriosis, these endometrial tissues, okay, they really react to the hormonal change. So whenever period or mens occur, uh, then at that area also there will be bleeding. That's why it is written as cyclical. Whereas in adenomyosis, it doesn't uh, you know, happen like that. Menorrhagia can happen, and 50% of the women are asymptomatic. Though adenomyosis is already there, they, are, they do not have any symptom. And the diagnosis is usually made incidentally by the pathologist when examining a surgical specimen. What does that mean? Uh, for example, hysterectomy was done for some other reason. We send that uh, you know, whole uh, uterus uh, uh, specimen to the pathology lab, and they, they are taking you know, uh, some biopsy from there and examining. And during that time, they found that certain endometrial glands and stroma are present in the wall of the uterus. They have found that incidentally. Okay, so that may be the presentation. Now, this picture will tell you a lot of things because it is very easy to understand. See here, a, a single okay, structure is present here, which is an adenomyoma. Adenomyoma, the multiples, we call it adenomyosis. That's why there is symmetrical enlargement of the uterus in adenomyosis. So globular, diffusely enlarged, symmetrical, tender uterus is adenomyosis. Uh, adenomyoma is a localized one. Adenomyosis is the diffuse one, diffuse enlargement of the uterus. Diagnosis is done by either ultrasound or MRI scan. Okay either ultrasound or MRI scan, and this can differentiate easily between adenomyosis and uterine fibroid. What is the treatment now? See here, there is no proven medical therapy for the treatment. Can you for GNRH agonist or analog and said, an OCP may be used for pain and bleeding. They have somehow help the patient. GNRH agonist will decrease the you know, estrogen level and said these are used for the uh, to decrease the pain and OCP, oral contraceptive pill. Now, what is the content of oral contraceptive pill? What is there? 
sir estrogen and progesterone estrogen progesterone very good very good excellent not only estrogen okay even progesterone is there and that progesterone is balancing the effect of estrogen there so oral contraceptive pill we'll take a class about uh, contraception in gynecology that's the important part of the lecture series uh, okay and we'll talk uh, in detail about that later on hysterectomy is a definite treatment so if uh, a lot of pain is there uterus is already significantly enlarged if the child bearing is complete means the family is complete then after taking consent from the lady or family we can go for hysterectomy okay after that the confirmation is can be done by histological examination of the specimen again the hysterectomy are of two type abdominal and vaginal now see this uh, you know these are the differential diagnosis for enlarged non pregnant uterus in the you know, beginning of the class also this slide was highlighted a uh, leiomyoma and adenomyosis both of them cause enlargement of the uterus and that uterus is non pregnant but what is the difference between them leiomyoma lead to asymmetrical enlargement of the uterus because one tumor may be somewhere another tumor may be in some other place of uterus it can grow so fast that it can lead to abnormal contour of the uterus that is called asymmetrical enlargement whereas adenomyosis is a diffuse enlargement the symmetrical enlargement in leiomyoma it is form type of enlargement okay in adenomyosis it is soft but it is tender in adenomyosis whereas leiomyoma is non tender but there are certain exceptions here in case of red degeneration okay it is very very painful or tender type of enlargement okay so at the end i like to request you all to like the video as much as possible share it among your friends and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings thank you so much